Okay, uh, hello everybody. Uh, today we will talk a bit more details about closed loop system and, and stability. So, we have st studied so far stability from the BBO point of view uh, or, or the bounded input, bounded input point of view and also stability in terms of uh, the equilibrium points and then we characterize those as the location of poles of my open or closed loop system depending on, on, on wherever you are. Uh, so, what we will uh, do today is to also look a little more details about uh, feedback, is feedback really helpful all the time or there are some drawbacks. We will skip the drawbacks part or we will you know, we'll not go too much into the details and we will just see how feedback helps us in, in, in lot of ways and also define something called the relative stability. Okay. So, so, open loop systems are heavily prone to disturbances. Right? So, the output is affected by the change in system parameter. The system parameters could be like, if I am talking of a mechanical system, a mass could change or any other thing could change in the system. It could also change because of uh, external environmental conditions like temperature, sometimes disturbances act into the system and I would, I really would not know how to, uh, uh, how to bring my system back to the original state. For example, if I am, if I am driving a car and my pedal is at a constant position, if I uh, hit a ramp you know, or, or an upslope, that is a disturbance, right? And if I keep the same pedal position and I keep going through the, through the ramp, uh, I will not be able to maintain the desired speed. And after a while, I might even lose the speed and I might just go to 0 speed, right? So, there is no automatic correction if I set my pedal speed uh, to its open loop value and just do not change it when the disturbance comes, right? Okay. In closed loop systems, uh, the output is actually measured and compared with the reference signal and which generates an error signal by which I update my control law and through the control law, I adjust my, my actuator which actually which gives the actual control input to the system. Right? So, typical things that could happen are you have effect of disturbance and you also have measurement noise. Right? So, my, my, my measuring devices may not be very accurate and you know they might, they might come with, with, with a bit of a noise. And so, how do we deal with those these things? The disturbance signal here and the measurement noise. So, we want to keep or, or design our controller or keep in mind such that I reject disturbances and I also uh, should, should reject the measurement noise. Okay. So, let us start with an example. right? So, uh, so this is a, a model for automatic control of speed for an automobile on a, st on a straight run. Right? So, I have uh, a reference speed, I have the measured speed and this generates an error signal which will decide the position of my throttle. Okay, so, the, uh, this is the throttle angle. Uh, there could be disturbances in terms of the road slope. It could either be a positive slope or a negative slope. No disturbance would just mean no slope. And this is a very simple model of my, of my car. Right? So, the car which you know, looks very big with lots of components actually you know, looks very small here. Right? It is just a first order differential equation or a system with just one pole. And I just get the desired speed. Right? So, uh, so, this is like the standard measuring devices like the tachometer and all and this will, this will convert it to the appropriate speed. Okay. So, the engine for simplicity is modeled as a first order system with a certain time constant and a gain of k with a typical value of 1.5. The input is the throttle uh, angle measured in degrees and the output is the desired speed. Right? And the, feed the speed feedback is obtained by a tachometer right, somewhere here. So, this is comes as, a, as, as, a, as in the feedback loop and this is used to obtain the error signal for changing the throttle angle. Right? And okay, for, for design purposes, we say that the throttle angle has a, has a time constant much less than, less than the system time constant and therefore, we could, we could ignore it. Right? And it is just modeled as a, as a small gain k1. Right? So, so, the error signal via k1 gives me the, the control input. Okay. And so, some typical value we could assume in, uh, in this case to be 50. The disturbance signal appears when the automobile runs up or on a down slope right? and it is, a, it is expressed in terms of percentage of the, of the, of the road slopes and uh, 90 degrees would actually mean that you are actually hitting a wall you know, and just going vertically upwards. Okay? So, 
and this signal is converted into equivalent throttle angle and then you have this, this kg which takes care of the units and you have this like kg is 100 degrees per unit percentage of the slope. Okay, so why are we doing this? So let us see if what happens if I just do not measure this guy, right? I have a reference and I just have the output, right? And there is no, no uh, feedback and also take the case of feedback, okay? So given the first condition or the first problem that my reference or, or not, not, not reference, my desired speed is uh, 60 kilometers per hour, that is in terms of the picture that would be V of S, okay? So V of S is uh, 60 kilometers, okay? Or say V of T more nicely. And then we have to find the R or the reference signal with the system being first open loop and second being closed loop. And we can also see how the steady state error changes with this, right? Okay. So, so let us say now in the open loop case, so at, at steady state, steady state speed is, is 60 and how will my transfer function look like? So it will be k1 times k over tau s plus 1, sorry. So this output is k1 k tau s plus 1 and some r of s, uh, okay, this will be a step signal, right? so I want to determine the size of the step. So let me just call it some number say r over s and I do the final value theorem and I just get that 60 is uh, this r times k1 times k, right? And then k1 was, uh, k1 was uh, this guy, 50, k is 1.5 and I do these computations and I get that r is 0 0.8, okay? That is kilometers per hour, okay? Okay, now let us see what is the steady state error. Right. So also, if I if I look at in the in the Laplacian domain, right? E S S. E sorry. E steady state. The Laplacian is R of S, the reference signal minus Y of S. Okay. So what we want to do is compare the errors. That is R of s minus y of s, okay. So y of s here or what, whatever is, 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 so y here is, is the velocity. So v of s would be equal to y of s. So y of s is again, uh, take this k1, k tau s plus 1, tau s plus 1 over, no, this is by R of S. So the error is uh, R of S 1 minus K1 times K by tau S plus 1. And at steady state, sorry, This error just becomes uh, ESS. I do the final value theorem as you know, uh, limit S going to 0, S times ESS of S. That will just be uh, so R is a step of some size 1 minus K1 times K. Okay, so this is this is my. Uh, uh, open loop error. Okay, so let us do the closed loop case. Okay, so in closed loop, uh, the reference is still 60 
is R. I can just uh, I'll directly write the steady state expression, right? So I just take care, you know, get rid of all all the transients. One plus k one times k. So I'm just finding this one, right? I'm finding R in the closed loop case when the desired speed is sixty. So I do all the computations and I get R as sixty point eight. Right, the reference is again again a speed. Okay, so now what is the error here? Is again um, I look at the signal here. Right, that is again uh, R of s minus output here is R of s k one times k over 1 plus k 1 times k. So, this is r of s and just have 1 over 1 plus k 1 times k. Okay. So, just for simplicity assume that r is just 1. So, in the open loop case if I just say what is the steady state error this would be for the values of k 1 and k which were 50 and 1.5 this would be minus 74 and the, and the steady state her error here would be 1 over 1 plus 75 and this is, this is significantly smaller than here. right? So, I, I have a very big steady state error over here and I have a, have a fairly smaller steady state error over here. right? So, so, you see how the feedback or the closed loop reduces the steady state error. Okay. In the next case, uh, let us do some transient analysis. right? So, earlier we had did we have done the steady state analysis. So, we want to find uh, in what time does the vehicle reach 90 percent of its steady state value for the open and closed loop system. So, let us just do first for the open loop case. Okay. So, in the, in, the, in the time domain I could write this directly V t is uh, 60 1 minus e power minus t over 20. Okay. So, this is like straightforward to write from, from the expression. Okay. So, 90 percent of this value would be 54 is 60 and I want to find out the time let me call this t 1 at which this occurs. So, I have an equation here where there is one unknown. So, I can easily compute t 1 to be 46 seconds. Okay. Now, let us see what happens in the closed loop case. Okay. So, in the closed loop case, so my uh, let me just first write the s is k 1 times k over tau s plus 1 plus k 1 times k. Okay. And this is multiplied by the r of s okay so i just do some some manipulations and computations so in this in this case uh, my r of s for the closed loop it comes from what i had computed over here okay? so this is 60.8 60.8 and then it's it's a laplacian in the laplacian it will be 60.8 whereas in the in the previous case my r for the open loop when I use I will use this 0.8 kilometers per hour. Right? So, here when I do it here, so in, in, the, in the open loop case my r is 0.8 kilometer per hour. So, just be careful of that. Okay? So, uh, now I just write down the final expression for v of t, I will skip a bit of computations. So, what I have 60 1 minus e power uh, minus t over 0.263. I just do nothing. I just substitute these values and then compute the inverse Laplace transform. And we now by now know how to do these things. So, again uh, this 90 percent would be 68. I have 1 minus e power minus let me call this T 2 over 0 0.263 and I compute uh, T 2 that is actually it turns out to be uh, just same this 0 0.6 seconds. Right? So, this is the open loop and this is the closed loop and you see that this is 77 approximately 
times faster right so if i just have have a closed loop my steady state error is much smaller and also my response of the system is pretty fast okay so this will motivate us towards towards you know analyzing what are the effects of feedback on the system first we saw well it helps in the steady state response it also helps in the transient response okay are there anything else associated with feedback okay now in the initial block diagram we mentioned few other things in in, in addition to the reference and the output so one was the noise sorry the, the disturbance and second was the noise okay so in the presence of disturbance and the noise i can compute the overall output of the system or overall response of the system as this, as the sum of response just to the reference signal and while computing this i set d and n equal to 0 then i compute the response by setting uh, r and n to be equal to 0 this will give me the response to the disturbance signal and lastly for the noise i set the remaining two inputs to zero and i just use the superposition so this is the total response to the reference signal to the disturbance signal and the noise okay so let let me just uh, define the loop gain as gc times g so if you have just forgotten where this gc and g comes from well these are just these guys right so gc is my is my controller is the plant this is hs is what happens in the feedback i have the reference signal here the disturbance and the noise okay okay so the error now becomes of course a function of of what is the reference and something to do with the controller transfer function and the plant transfer function similarly with the disturbance and also with with the noise okay so i can just uh, compute this directly and these are i think in one of the tutorial classes we we saw how to compute the effect of disturbance and then take the total response of the system as the sum of the response to the disturbance and uh, combine it to the to the response of the input right so just just a superposition okay so and when we started this uh this this lecture we said well there could be some parameter variations right and then now we'll see what is the effect of parameter variations on the system okay so assume there is no disturbance and noise we'll come to this very shortly so say my transfer function or the plant changes from g to delta of g okay and then the error signal changes accordingly so i'm not i'm just doing something very simple here so e which is 1 over 1 plus l times r l is gc times g i just substitute instead of g g plus a small number delta g okay so this is how how my error looks like right okay now the change in the tracking error can be computed you can just say what is delta e you take and this guy here and then e i just substitute uh, this guy e is 1 over 1 plus l times r of s and i get this uh, expression right so this is if if again if delta g is 0 this goes to 0 right that's a, the trivial case to check this okay the change in the tracking error is uh, something like this gc and delta g and you have lots of terms of delta g influencing this uh, this this particular number okay so if i just take an open loop right so i have okay i'll just for convenience i'll just draw it here and i hope i'll use the right notation so this was r of s and this was c of s okay now the error is usually defined as r minus c of s so in this case this is r i just omit the, the s for the moment c g c times g uh times r okay now e plus delta e in our case turns out to be r okay r 1 minus g c g plus delta g okay so this is how uh, my error looks like and therefore delta of e 
would be this guy minus the original error. Original error was what? That was 1 the r 1 minus g c times g all with, with uh, in the, the s domain. Okay, if I just compare these things, so I just subtract uh, this from this. So, what I am left with is minus g c times delta g. Okay, let me write this s here. Okay, this is also in s. Okay, so, this is again in the open loop. Okay. Now, just me compare to what happens in the closed loop. So, I have the error signal is of course, uh, so I do some approximation that g c times g is much larger than the, 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 the very small change and I can I get an approximate ex expression like this that this, that this is the, the change in error is g c times delta g 1 plus l whole square times r s. Okay? So, if you compare this with this you see that the tracking error is reduced by a factor of 1 plus l of s with the square. Okay, and for large values of L of s, I can just again ignore this one and just write L s, and I just get uh, this this expression. Isn't this, this is not not difficult to obtain, right? So uh, the way you do this is you have minus G C and you have a delta G. I uh, just ignore this one. I have just keep this L of s here, and L of s is again uh, G C times G, right? So this guy goes away, and you have a R of s. And this is what remains, right? You have a delta g and a g, and right? And then, okay. So, what does this mean? That large values of l of s result in smaller changes in the tracking error. Okay. Is there, is there something which I could change in l of s? Well, uh, so l l of s, if you just recall, was g c of s times g of s. So, one could uh, this could be well, you know, change the plant. Well, I really do, don't want to do that, right? Because the plant is already uh, there is something which I am given to control, I just cannot change the subject or, or the plant. So, I can just manipulate my GC in such a way that I, it results in small, uh, smaller changes in, in tracking error. Okay? So, this is about how feedback changes the error or helps in reduction of error. Okay? Now, uh, so what we saw was essentially this delta E related to small changes in the system parameter. Now, let us try to, to quantify that a little more. Right? So, we call the system sensitivity, so we will define this new term as the ratio of change in the transfer function to the change in the process transfer or, or some small parameter. So, I have the, the T as, as a transfer function, so let us just understand it from here. So, I want to ch check how my overall transfer function changes with small changes in g. Right? So, this is what I call as the sensitivity. Ch this is s, how does it, how does the, how sensitive is the transfer function t to changes in g. Okay? So, what is t here? This is my closed loop transfer function. Okay? So, the sensitivity I define, so just from, from here I just I say dt by dg over t of g. Okay? And this is how it looks like. Sensitivity of my transfer function with respect to g or changes in g is simply this one. Okay. Okay, let me go here, right. okay, again I just start with, uh, I am just looking at the sensitivity with respect to disturbance, right, which when, in which case I set the, the reference and the noise to be 0 and I can compute the tracking error. Right? So, this is E of s is minus g. 1 plus L of s. So, if I if I were just to write the sensitivity in terms of L, this would just be 1 over 1 plus L, where L is again what I call as the loop gain L of s. And then just to recall again, L of s was G c of s times G of s. Okay. So, this is my error with respect to disturbance and it takes this term, right? So, 1 over 1 plus L is the sensitivity sensitivity of the transfer function which changes in g times g times d right okay if gs is fixed which is usually the case then with increase in the loop gain so i want to reduce the error right? typically my error should be zero if there is disturbance there should be no error right so how do i well but then you know if i have a disturbance i would expect that there is some error so if there is some error i would want to to minimize the error right 
So, if Gs is fixed, then with increase in loop gain, this guy, the effect of disturbance can be decreased, right? Okay. So, something which I will briefly introduce now is okay. So, is, is something related to frequency. We'll we'll talk a little more of this uh, when we talk of frequency domain. So, disturbance signals are typically signals of of low frequency, right? So maybe like a, a step or or even if they this is oscillatory behavior in in the disturbance, they will just be. Uh, at a very low frequency. In the, in the car example, my disturbances are either I, I hit a uphill or a downhill or something like that. You know, it will just be a constant thing without, without any disturbance, right? So, disturbance signals are mostly introduced or these this usually occur at low frequency, okay? So, so my L is, okay, if I just look at how it varies with frequency, I can just see the magnitude of L at frequencies, right? So, at low frequency, so I want so, what, what does it say that or this expression tell me that with increase in loop gain, the effect of disturbance decreases. Now, I do not have to increase it like forever, right? So, L I know depends on, on frequencies and my disturbance signals are associated to certain frequencies or certain lower frequencies. So, I want G to be sorry this L to be increased at low frequency. So, this should be bigger for lower frequencies. Okay. So, this essentially means that I, uh, I, I uh, increase the controller gain at low frequency, right? Or in other way, I am just, so if, if uh, th this increases, my sensitivity decreases. So, I just, I, uh, ideally I, I would want, I do not want to be sensitive to disturbance, right? Whatever happens, I just, I just should reject it, okay? But typically that does not happen, right? So, we can only decrease the sensitivity. So, so, uh, so when I when I try to increase this at at low frequency, my sensitivity decreases, right? At low frequencies, I don't really care what happens at high frequencies at the moment because there are no disturbance signals which come at high frequencies. Okay. Now, what about this noise? Right? We so far haven't talked about it, but then usually my measurement comes comes with with some noise, right? Okay. So tracking error in terms of the measurement is is, is something like this, right? Again, it's is from the original expressions which we which we obtained. So, this guy L over 1 plus L is also known as the complementary sensitivity function. So, some people denote it as T, some people denote it as C and since we have already used a notation T and C we will not use it, we will just say this, uh, maybe just for, I can just call this S prime, the complementary sensitivity function. Okay. And this noise, so small loop gain, if I L is very small, it leads to a good noise attenuation, right, because you know this uh, the effect of noise uh, would be reduced. And typically noise signals are signals which occur at very high frequency or which uh, which get into the system and these signals are typically high frequency signals. Okay? So, for the purpose of noise attenuation, the loop gain is turned to be low of or of low values at very high frequency. Right? Previously what we had that I want the loop gain to be higher at lower frequencies that will eliminate my disturbance. For the purpose of noise attenuation, the loop gain is tuned to have lower values at high frequencies, right? So, when I do this, uh, the, the, the controller gain is increased at low frequencies for disturbance rejection and decreased at high frequencies for noise, noise attenuation, right? So, it is like a, some kind of a complementary effect over there. So, these are the two ways which you know based on what is the L of uh, j omega, I can I can deal with disturbance and noise together or reduce the effect of disturbance and the uh, effect of, of measurement noise. We will do more of this when we do a frequency response, right? you know what, what is actually mean, what is low frequency, what is high frequency and so on and how do I actually go about computing these things. That we will keep uh, till a little later when we do frequency response analysis. Okay, and something which we will use throughout from now on is what is called as the characteristic equation, right? So, what is the characteristic equation? Well, it's just I take the transfer function and I look at what is in the denominator. So, I know how to compute this, right? Given uh, g in the forward loop, h in the in the, in the negative loop, uh, the overall transfer function uh, t of s from r to c is g over one plus g, 
okay. So, the transfer function sorry the characteristic equation is when I equate the denominator of this guy to 0 right 1 plus g times h equal to 0 okay. And so, if, if, if h equal to 1 then I am I am like kind of something very simple right 1 plus g of s equal to 0 okay. So, now this is a system with a non unity feedback. Now, is it possible that I do some magic and I convert this to a system which looks like this. Let me call this g prime of s sorry there is nothing here uh, okay. So, and then plus a minus with this to be 1, this guy is still being r and this guy is still being c right. So, I just want to convert this non unity feedback system to a unity feedback system. Can I do this? Well, the answer is yes. So, what I do is I just equate. So, how will this transfer function look like? That is simply g prime of s over 1 plus g prime of s and I find out what is g prime in terms of g and h okay. So, a non unity feedback system can be transformed into a unity feedback system by just using this transformation. This should be very straightforward to compute because you are just dealing with very uh, easy looking linear equations over here okay. So, so g prime would be this one, h prime would be 1 right. And while I do this the characteristic equation remains the same. So, if I just look at 1 plus g prime h prime of s, this is 1 plus g prime of s and I will just get this. This again uh, simple computations will take you from 1 plus g prime h prime to 1 plus g times h right. This is nothing special happening over here yeah okay. So, let us revisit stability for a while right. So, I start with the with a system that looks that looks like this right. So, this is I know that this is stable because I have sorry this is unstable because there is a pole on the right hand side. So, anything on the right hand side unstable right. So, can I do something with this right, so can I do something so, so as to make this system stable? Well, I just say okay I just take uh, the negative feedback h of s just to be a number. 3 and I take the closed loop transfer function set the characteristic equation to 0 and the poles of the closed loop system are now minus 1 by 2 plus minus j root over 3 by 2 right. So, these are complex conjugate poles, but which are again in the LHP right in the in the left half plane right. So, this this guy. So, all all poles are to the left half plane and therefore, the closed loop system is stable right. So, I start with a open loop system which is unstable I can stabilize it with just some feedback right. So, this is one one advantage which I get when I when I do feedback right. I can make uh, unstable systems stable. Is it possible always that give me any unstable system can I make it uh, stable via feedback? Well, that may not always be possible, but I, but it uh, in, in several cases it is possible okay. So, what does uh, what are the advantages? Okay, advantages is I, I can see that I can have improved stability, I can uh, have decreased sensitivity to, to parameters, I can deal with disturbances, uh, I can deal with noise right and we could also increase bandwidth. We will see this when we do the frequency uh, response of the system, but then my overall gain of the system reduces right because I have some, some multiplicative factor over there right. So, so, so here, so okay I go here and okay this. Uh, kind of give some some attenuation which may not always be desirable. So, that is one of the drawbacks and of course, I would have uh, increased cost uh, to, to deal with and sometimes a bit of complexity too, but of, of course, you know the advantages are, are, are a lot more compared to the disadvantages okay. So, sometimes now we have seen you know how the system uh, could be sensitive to change in parameters right. Uh, so, we will see does that have any effect on stability and that is called relative stability right. So, at the moment we just talked about is the system stable or unstable right nothing more right. So, now given a system can we define some kind of a relative stability, relative stability means can a small 
change in the parameter of the system make it unstable, right? And then that we will define it as the, you know, there will also be some measures of stability that if my system parameters are between so and so, I could still be stable, right? So, for example, if I am, I am making cooking food and the, the you know, I just download something from, from some khana.com or you know all those, all those websites and I say, they say, okay, one tablespoon of, of salt. But if I just put one tablespoon plus one percent or minus one percent, it does not really kill the taste, right? But if I put two tablespoons, that might be, that might be awful. If I put zero tablespoons, that might still not be very good. So, but then there is some amount of relative stability, right? You can, you can go slightly higher or slightly lower and still maintain stability, right? Stability in, in, in terms of the taste. But if I am making tandoori chicken and it says put on the oven for 20 minutes, but if I say 22 minutes, then I might, you know, not really get something, something very edible, right? So, that, that, that little thing could be unstable over there. Okay, 20 minutes, 1 second could be okay, but if I do 20 minutes uh, plus 2 more minutes, that could, you know, give me something, something very strange, right? So, so these are, these are things which, you know, changes in little, little parameters sometimes affect stability, sometimes would not affect stability. So, if I am looking that I am, you know, I am playing a cricket match and my team is chasing a score of something in some 20 overs and at the end of 15 overs, I am, you know, uh, I still need uh, 40 runs with 5 wickets in hand, I could still say, well, I can still, still win the game, right? Because my required rate is not too much. But all of a sudden, if I lose 2 wickets, right, then that could be a recipe for disaster. I could go from a winning zone directly to a losing zone, right? So, these are things where, you know, you are stable, stable, stable and you can all of a sudden become, become unstable. And that is exactly what uh, is the concept of, of relative stability. Okay, so we do not really deal with uh, food or, or sport here, we deal with physical systems. So, what does, what does it de mean in our case, right? So, we look at our stability in terms of the location of the poles, right? Well, typically complex poles or real poles or, or whatever, right? So, so, what I said is in terms of, of systems, uh, if I say, well, I am, I am here, here, so these are these are my poles, and I say I have a system which typically would look like this: K, a G, a H, the plus, a minus. This is my R. This is my C, or the output. And say I, I I design my system. I work very hard, and I say well, my system is stable. It has poles at plus minus 0.1. Sorry. Uh, not plus minus, it should only be minus, okay. So, I am given a, a, a fantastic design problem uh, and I just say this, my poles are at point 0.1 plus minus j whatever, say 2, right. I work very hard and I submit this as my thesis and I say my controller works because my poles are here, right. So, these are my poles, okay. And two days later, you know, my supervisor comes and checks it. You know, some something would have gone wrong there, right? You know, my my mass would have been a little little different than earlier, or you know, uh, some some uh, rats might have chewed on where, to something where my mass de slightly decreases. And I when when I run the system again, so my maybe you know these guys just jump here, right? Or maybe I did did it in an air conditioned environment. The power goes off. And I am presenting this to the examiners or my supervisor in a different environment where the parameters might change and say, oh, what I see, the response, oh, so it goes unstable, right? So, my poles could just be instead of minus 0.1, it would just be 0.1 plus minus j2. This could happen, right? So, and we will see there are lots of cases where this will happen. And therefore, when I, when I design things, I will say, well, I do not just do not want stability. I want something like, like more stable. Right? It's, it's, it's like this, right? Somewhere. Okay, so, so I want my poles to be somewhere here, not, not just left of uh, 0, but say at minus 1 or further left of, uh, left of minus 1. So, I want to be, to, to have a little, little buffer uh, for, 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 for myself to, to, to do these things, right? Okay. So, so these are things which, which we can talk about, you know, in a, of, of, of relative stability. Now, do we have any tools where I can say, 
where we can we can actually quantify relative stability we have learned the routh table right so let's see if i could say something about relative stability may not be very useful in terms of exact analysis but some some uh, preliminary analysis i could do about uh, relative stability right okay so i have a, a closed loop characteristic equation where i just you know factorize that uh, them in terms of uh, n poles right so there is a direct relation over here so the relative stability can be determined by using routh hurwitz criterion by just shifting the axis right so uh, if i say start with this guys you know say consider a system a third order system and i say is it stable i do the routh uh, thing and i say everything is positive 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 no sign change and therefore my system is stable okay but this does not help because you know if my temperature changes slightly or you know, some little thing goes wrong here and there then i go to unstable therefore i will pose a slightly different problem to be a little more uh, comfortable okay. and i say well are the plane so are all the poles over here to uh, are they at left of minus 1 until now i was only interested in left of 0 but if i have at minus 1 i have a little margin here right so even if the temperature increases which shifts the pole maybe from minus 1 to 0.8 i am still stable right and therefore i want to push them you know as slightly further to the left okay so the way we check this is is like this so let me define a new variable called s1 which is s plus 1 okay so my s now will become s1 minus 1 okay and i rewrite so this is my new new coordinate frame where the origin is minus 1 comma 0 okay so if i take a characteristic equation which is s plus 2 equal to 0 which has a pole at uh, at at minus 2 how will this pole look in like in the new coordinates okay so my s is s1 Minus one plus two equal to zero. This means I have s one plus one equal to zero, which is okay, right? So in in my in my new coordinates, sorry, in my old coordinates, I was at a distance of minus two from the origin. If this is the new origin at minus one, I should be at a distance of minus one from the new origin, right? So that that is just what this guy tells us. So simply put, if I were to check for a general uh polynomial here so are the roots of this equation to the left of minus 1 i just substitute this guy right so in the new coordinates s1 i just do this substitution my characteristic equation looks like this now i do the entire routh table thing for this one right so okay so is a 1 and 4 1 4 so this row will go to 0 i'll have an auxiliary polynomial and i'll just solve for the x0 you know the differentiate this and then i do all these things okay so first is uh, there is no sign change and therefore there are no roots on the shifted plane there are no roots which are on the right hand side of minus 1 however there are two roots here so we can say this is in some sense called marginally stable with respect to to this axis of course in the original coordinates it will not have an have a have a sustained oscillatory behavior that we should be a little careful of so i'm just saying well it is not left of minus 1 but there are a couple of guys who are just sitting on on minus 1 marginally stable with respect to this new shifted uh, coordinate that is minus 1 and 0 okay so what we have done so far is we started with the concept of stability we defined some criterion for bbo stability we also found out how we uh, given a transfer function how i compute its stability given then a higher order polynomial i i we we had an algebraic method to compute are there any unstable poles we looked at uh, closed loop system advantages of feedback and some analysis on on relative stability some very very basic analysis on how stable my system is so what we will do next is to focus on on these kind of things of relative stability and see if there are more sophisticated analytical tools which is called the root locus method we will see how my pole locations respond which changes to certain things in the systems so these are essentially you know conditions derived you know derived by even and called the root locus techniques we will study some construction rules 
uh, of of uh, of this graph called the root locus technique okay thank you